Well, why am I here? I don't know. I'm, uh, I've been in technology. I think back uh, when I was, uh, I'm not going to tell you, I was 13 in the 70s. 1978, I built my own uh, computer. I etched my own uh, circuit board and wrote my own operating system, and uh, it made a circle. And that was a big deal back then. Um, and since then, you know, I've been in and out of computers. I discovered Fast Cars and Girls, and Gates didn't. <laughs> and uh, here I am today. <laughs> well, um, I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are, uh, in the beginning, when people first find out about them, they're learning experience from many of them, and they figure out what the heck money is, because many people don't know what money is, because they've just progressively desensitized at utilizing money all day, and they don't really know what it is. And now, when we say, well, we only have, you know, 12 and a half million, and by the year 2140, we're going to have 21 million uh, Bitcoin, like, well, how many dollars are there? I'm always like, well, I don't know. I think uh, the last admin this administration just made 19 trillion of them. I tell them right away. Well, like, how many? So, Everyone asks me, why did I build the Bitcoin Center? Or why did we build the Bitcoin Center? And uh, it's a tough question to answer. Um, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I lost my shirt every time, pretty much, you know. Uh, I always follow ideals instead of the cash, and that usually sometimes doesn't end that well financially, but all of a sudden you have all this knowledge and you can keep going. So why am I standing up here? I want to tell you guys a few things. Not tell you, but I want to express to you uh, things that um, maybe someone should have told me. <laughs> I want to express to you that the people in this room have a, a incredible power to be able to affect change. Yep you're probably going to get rich. You're going to have a bunch of digits next to your name. You're going to take a black car instead of a, a bus somewhere. And, uh, you know, you're going to have an airplane, maybe, and uh, all that jazz. But after you make a whole bunch of money, and you lose it a few times, and you make it again, the things that stick in your life are, believe it or not, after you help people. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I uh, helped build the Bitcoin Center, because I believe in the long run, humanity is going to have a better taste for what, how monetary policy uh, affects the world. We all know about the two and a half billion unbanked. To us right now, it might be a uh, uh, we've been desensitized to that, but that means there are people throughout the world who don't um, have a bank account. I had some people working for me in Sri Lanka, and I had to send them a credit card, a debit card, and that's how they spent the money, because there was no way to send them money. So now they get Bitcoin. So why did I, why did I open the Bitcoin Center? It always comes down to this story about my bicycle when I was a kid. Uh, and my dad. My dad has uh, been a, a big influence in my life. And uh, he didn't have much money growing up. You know, he was an orphan during the war uh, in Greece. And uh, he was an auto mechanic. And he brought home to me my first bicycle. Now, my first bicycle was built with pieces that he found. So it was like a rusty red bicycle. It had a different, size, different training wheel on one side, different training wheel on the other. And uh, he gave it to me. I didn't know any better. I was, I don't know, five years old or whatever. And uh, I started riding it around. And then all the neighbor's kids had fancy bicycles. This was in Astoria, Queens right down uh, on the other side of the river here. And all the neighbor's kids had fancy bicycles, probably bought with uh, 
loans and stuff. It was an honest currency. I mean, honest bicycle. So I had this uh, bicycle with the training wheels, and then I just put it in the back of the hallway when they made fun of me. The kids made fun of me. And then one day my father comes home and he goes, why don't you ride the bicycle? He worked day and night from uh, 6 in the morning till 10 at night. So on Sunday we got to see him when he woke up at 2 in the afternoon. He goes, why don't you ride the bicycle? And I didn't know what to tell him. I said, uh, I don't like the training wheels. I said real fast as an excuse. So my father's real quick. He was a mechanic and his hands were really strong. He just took them right off. Took the nuts right off there, right? I have notes over here, hold on. <laughs> so, I get the, he holds a bicycle to me, he pushes over to me and I look out the front door and there are the kids with the fancy bicycles, right? I'm like, listen, in Greek it's me katapiezune. That means they're oppressing me. The kids outside are oppressing me. I mean, for a little kid to say, Greek is a better operating system, I think, than English. It's more like Linux, and you guys are on like Windows 3.1 or something. But it's okay. You can always learn Greek. So I said, and he said, well, he says, there, these guys are uh, oppressing you? He goes, wow, you must be pretty oppressible. <laughs> you got all these cryptocurrency guys out there should think about that. Yeah, we're probably as oppressed as we're oppressing ourselves to be or allowing ourselves to be without being as flamboyant as we should be with this new technology that's been created that we can uh, probably feel. I mean, the world is a bountiful place. And uh, they're telling me that when, uh, 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 through monetary policy, all of a sudden, everyone in the family has to work in relation to the 50s, right? And in this, in this, this was in the 60s. My father was the only one working. What happened? The planet lost half its food all of a sudden or something? I'm not sure. Maybe it's got something to do with the amount of currency that's out there. I'm not sure. I'm not saying that, but it could be. I said, look. So he said, you know, how oppressible, you know, Maybe you're oppressed, feel oppressed because you're so oppressible right now. And I said, oh. Then he said, well, you know, there's millions, milluni. I go, there's millions. He said, there's millions of them out there. When you go out there, there's millions of them that might want to stop you if you allow them. I go, oh, okay, okay. He says, well, we're going to learn to uh, ride the bicycle today, he said to me. We're going to have a lot of times in our lives that we're going to have to do something we've never done. We're going to have to put ourselves outside there where we've never been before. And, uh, that's what, and this is one of those times. So I'm walking out, uh, trying to, I'm pushing the bicycle through the hallway, long hallway. And he says, uh, always look where you're going. Always look where you're going. Never look back. He said, only look where you're gonna, where you want to be. So I'm thinking to myself, yeah, okay. So I'm right now, I'm trying to, as a sponge, trying to get all the information he's given me so I can take this bicycle without any training wheels for the first time in my life and ride it, right? To me, it was a new thing. Let me get the notes out again. Oh, then I said to him, I said, what if someone, when I'm riding the bicycle, is in my way? Dad, he says, he said to me right away, he said, well, even the whole world will step aside when you know where you're going. He said, even the whole world will step aside when you know where you're going. So I said, all right, the whole world's going to step aside when I know where I'm going. So I got the bicycle, and I'm pushing it. Now I'm going out, I'm outside. It's a very, uh, the story hits me hard. 
Jeez. So he said, I'm going to hold the seat. You're going to hear me running. But I run fast, so fast that you're not even able to hear me after a while. I said, OK. All right. I said, uh, I said, you know, what if it doesn't work? What if I fall? He says, you're always going to fall. Everybody falls. Some people don't get back up after they fall. <laughs> they don't want to get back up. They won't get back on the horse. They won't get back on a bicycle. They won't go back up. They won't go in their business again. They won't. They won't milk life. I said, listen, Dad, I need more time. I need more time. I can't do this right now. I need more time. He said, there is no more time. You only get so, many, so much time, and there's no more. He goes, you have to give more of you within that time. You have to give you more of you per minute. Right now, this moment, you have to give the most of you because there's no more time. The time is going to finish for everybody. And right now, you have this moment and you have to take from it life. You have to steal from life, from time, your life and squeeze everything you ever want to do in this moment, right now, at this moment, and get on that bicycle and ride that bicycle. And I said, whoa. I said, okay. I said, there's no more time. And he saw me, I was a little shaken. And then he pulled this ancient Greek crap on me. And he said, Varda tu Leonida, Varda Macedoni, que o Nicolaki sa dixi voli, que o tatiji que petiji voli, dice tatiji que rayisi. You got that? <laughs> he said, move to the side, armies of Leonidas, that's the Spartans, and move to the other side, Alexander's men. Because little Nick is going to throw his hammer, and as he throws his hammer, it, gets, it goes further and more powerful and more accurate till one day he will crack the earth in half. So when he said that, I felt pretty good. <laughs> and I got on a bicycle and I start pedaling the bicycle and he's running behind me and I'm riding and then I don't hear him anymore and I go to turn around and the bike starts shaking and I'm like, oh, look where you want to go. So I'm riding, and then there's people that I knew, and they're walking across the street. And I look at them, the bike starts shaking, and uh, then I remember, he said, oh, there's millions of those people. Just look where you want to go. So I got to the corner, and I go, oh, shit, how do I make it around the corner? I never turn. I said, oh, look where you want to go. So I looked around the corner, and I made it around the corner, just like that. Now I'm on this big street, Broadway, and there's all these people. And I said, oh, I'm going to hit one of these people. Then he said, I remember what he said. He said, the world steps aside if you know where you're going. After you know where you're going, the world's going to step aside for you. So I, start, I, said, <laughs> I started riding for these people, and they moved out of the way. I came back, I made it all the way around the block, and the kids were there, they started cheering for me. They still had their training wheels, of course, you know? They started cheering for me. So that was a good experience. I kept riding around the block fast, fast, started raining. I didn't know how to stop. I had a bunch of garbage cans, but that's, <laughs> I got back up, right? So the day I had to commit to the lease on 40 Broad, it was a very windy day. And I was questioning, I was like, you know what? What the hell am I doing? Am I crazy? I got retinal vasculitis. I can't see. I like a bunch of eye surgeries. 
this year. You know, decades ago, I got hit with a jet ski. I was in and out of the hospital for a year. I had a ruptured stomach, a ruptured spleen, a collapsed lung, 12 broken ribs, broken sternum, bruised and large heart, 18 units of blood in the Bahamas, the big hose in a bucket with pus was coming out of me. Now they're cutting my eyes open. Right now, I can't really see that much. I can't see. And it's been like that for I don't know how many months now, five months, six months. They're cutting my eyes open, my, ugh, my eyeballs open. I got run over by a cab. I got a compound fracture over here when I got back, when I got better. Then I got back on a jet ski. I broke some more ribs. I'm not telling you to, I'm not saying this to impress you. <laughs> I'm trying to impress upon you that, yeah, you're going to get messed up. You're going to get messed up out there. And the only guys that made it are the ones that just get back up. So, yeah, my heart stopped five minutes. I didn't know any better. I got back up. So I'm on my way to go commit 10 years for the Bitcoin Center. And I say to myself, what am I doing? I'm going blind. What the hell am I doing? I believe in Bitcoin. I, you know, I know that Bitcoin can help millions upon millions, if not billions of people. I don't know how fast. It's up to you guys. So I, I said, Dad, send me a sign. I said, send me a sign. You got to send me a sign. I don't know why I said that. He passed away three, four, five years ago. And once in a while I say that, I said, send me a sign. And I'll do it or I won't do it. Just uh, the next piece of data I get, I'm going to taint it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take the next piece of data and it's going to make, it's going to allow me, it's going gonna, it's gonna to set forth my future. I don't care. I'm rolling the dice. I don't care. Just give me one. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying like a crazy person. I'm asking my dad to send me a piece of data. So it's so windy. I had to go into a doorway because there was so much wind. I was looking for a cab. And on top of, on top of a doorknob was a deck of cards. Right on top of the doorknob like this. Right? Uh, balancing. It was just there. I said, what the hell is that? Is that the sign? I go, you're nuts, Nick. So I leaned the cards against the door and the doorknob, and I left. I walked down the block. I walked down the block, and there's a bicycle store there. I go, is that the sign? I go, that's too simple. That bicycle store has been there for years. <laughs> that's not the sign. And then I say, holy, holy shit, I said. And I ran back to the deck of cards. And there you go, bicycle on the deck of cards. And that's what happened. <laughs> oh.